Good evening. My name is Jim Waltman and I'm the Executive Director of the Watershed Institute. And I'm delighted that you're able to join us this evening for an absolutely critical and important program. The Watershed Institute works to keep water clean, safe, and healthy. And this is an urgent mission that we know is getting more urgent with every passing day. With climate change and land uses often unchecked, the impact on our water, the quality, the flooding, um, these are having enormous impacts on our communities, on our businesses, and our homes. And it wasn't many months ago we saw this in strong uh, order with the huge storms that came through New Jersey and other states. We pursue our mission of, of protecting water through land conservation, environmental advocacy, watershed science, and environmental education. And I'm very fortunate to work with an extremely talented, hardworking crew of three dozen scientists who are monitoring water quality in our region and designing and implementing solutions to environmental challenges. Environmental advocates who press our state Department of Environmental Protection and Legislature and press our municipal leaders to do more, to do better, to be stronger in protecting our precious environment. And educators who teach more than 10,000 kids, teens and adults every year about STEM, about natural history and about our role in protecting the environment. I'm coming to you tonight from the LEED Platinum Watershed Center. This is our, our home base and we're located on a nearly thousand acre nature reserve near Pennington, New Jersey. If you're tuning in from far, we, we hope you'll come um, visit us soon. Now, before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that the land and waters that are now under our care is within the traditional and ancestral home of the Lenni Lenape people. We pay respect to Lenape people's past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. We also recognize that environmental challenges are quite often most pressing and severe in communities with the least amount of financial resources, typically in communities of color. This is a sad legacy and one that needs to be corrected and that the Watershed Institute is committed to addressing. Now, I also want to acknowledge that this is a particularly difficult moment for the world. We're now in the third year of a global pandemic. We have war raging in Europe and of course, we're witness, witnessing ever increasing, increasingly severe impacts of climate change around the world. Now with that backdrop, one might question the timing of tonight's program. After all, uh, at a superficial glance, um, if you take a look at tonight's uh, speaker's wonderful work, you'll see that America's drinking water supply is severely threatened with a dizzying array of contaminants, faulty regulatory systems, inadequate resource. Um, there's plenty to be upset about, concerned about, depressed about. But I think that you'll find tonight's speaker, despite all that he's been, that he's discovered from all of his research and his writings, at heart, he's an optimist. Uh, at least I've heard him say that on one of his many, many um, appearances on uh, the popular media. And I think he'll he'll leave us all with at least some degree of hope, despite the very real problems that he'll be discussing tonight. Seth Siegel is a writer, a lawyer, an activist, and serial entrepreneur. He's also an acclaimed public speaker, and we're extremely fortunate to have him with us here tonight. Mr. Siegel is the author of the award-winning, critically acclaimed New York Times bestseller, Let There Be Water, Israel's Solution for a Water-Starved World, which is now in print or production in more than 20 international editions, representing more than 50 countries. His second book, which we're really focused on tonight, Troubled Water, What's Wrong with What We Drink, presented an ambitious agenda for a fundamental rethinking of America's drinking water system. His essays have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, 
and in leading publications across Europe and Asia. Mr. Siegel is a senior fellow at the University of Wisconsin Center for Water Policy and is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a graduate of Cornell University and the Cornell Law School and was a graduate student in international relations in Jerusalem. Um, Seth, I'm so delighted and grateful that you're joining us tonight. Um, and uh, if the, the magic of StreamYard, which is our little twist on Zoom here, works well. I'm sure we'll all really appreciate uh, what you have to say tonight. Um, now, we didn't, we're not asking you, nor did you request an opportunity to just speak for the next hour. Um, we're going to make this more of a conversation, which I think will be a more engaging way to do this. Um, but, you know, I'd like to start with uh, uh, kind of a, a foundational question. And I'm, I'm just curious how you got started on this journey. Um, you've become one of the most knowledgeable uh, people on this issue. Um, there's a lot there. You've explored decades and decades of history. How did this get started? Well, first of all, Jim, I want to thank you and the Watershed Institute for inviting me to uh, join you tonight and to uh, your membership and whoever is either watching live now or later, Tom, on, our, on a rebroadcast on Facebook or one of the other media that we will uh, employ these days. Uh, I am an admirer of the Watershed Institute. I know you didn't ask me to say this and you didn't put me up to it, but I'm an admirer of the Watershed Institute and the work you do dovetails almost precisely with my personal agenda. Um, uh, you know, I, am, I do write these books. I do give these speeches. As, as you know, I, I generally don't take fees and I uh, donate all my royalties to water-themed charities because I am passionate about this issue. It's not a it's not an employment opportunity for me. It's really it's really a cause I believe in, and when I find uh, kindred spirits, which you I know are, and I had the pleasure of getting to know several of your colleagues at the Watershed Institute, and I, I really want to thank you all for the great work that you do day in and day out. Uh, so I want to say that. So how, how did I get involved? It's it's kind of a crazy story of life. You know, uh, I, I never had a plan for my life. I've had a bunch of different careers, uh, and I sometimes liken myself to a cork floating in the water. And my my wife and kids refer to me as as Waldo, as in the Where's Waldo thing. That I seem to just keep showing up at interesting things, interesting intersections in business and policy areas, and not for profit areas. And it's served me well to give my, me an interesting life. But what specifically happened was we have to rewind the tape from before Troubled Water got written. I I became very interested in the policy implications of increasing uh, amounts of global, not just in the US, but global water scarcity. And the more I studied it, the more I realized that it was going to lead to higher food prices, greater instability in many countries, including countries important to the US. And that if we weren't careful, and we're seeing this now in Europe with the, the Ukraine disaster, uh, it was going to lead to uh, refugee flows, but not like a million or two or three or four, as we're seeing with Ukraine, but with, with hundreds of millions of people, uh, water refugees, having to pick up uh, to go to somewhere else where they might find water to grow their food and live their lives with. And, and that book I, I wrote really as much to educate myself and, and uh, uh, policymakers that I knew. I know a lot of senators and congressmen uh, through other work that I do. And I thought that it would be valuable to just have something that I could hand out to them. Uh, it became a complete Cinderella story. Uh, the book became a New York Times bestseller. As you mentioned, it's out in, it's actually 23 separate languages it's out in now around the world. And uh, it's really opened doors for me to speak very widely. Well, that book um, and the speaking widely come together as to how Troubled Water got written. So I was on the road several nights a week for a long time speaking to groups about, this is of course pre-COVID, about about water scarcity issues. And uh, among the last of the hundreds of interviews I did for Let There Be Water was with a professor in Israel who was talking about water, drinking water contamination and how he said that that was also going to cause water scarcity because water contamination would lead to people not feeling safe that they could drink their own water. And in a sense, if you're not drinking the water, it's like it isn't there. And I was on the road and I don't go to bars. Uh, I don't like, I don't go to bars ever actually, but I'm definitely not gonna go to the bar when I'm on the road by myself. And I don't really love watching television all that much. 
So I found myself sitting in my hotel rooms, kind of bored night after night. And one night, I don't know, I was on the road several weeks at that point, I wrote an email late at night, but it was middle of the night in Israel to that professor. And I said, I've been thinking about our conversation. And it occurred to me that I really don't know a lot of what you're talking about. Can you send me two or three scholarly articles written by you or others that might elucidate for me, might explain to me exactly what you meant about, about the closing off of drinking water? How bad is it? Until that point, I kind of drank the tap water. When I woke up the next morning, I had waiting for me 28 scholarly articles. And frankly, um, it's scholarly articles, uh, if you're not an academic, are a language onto themselves. You have to sort of learn the lingo. And over the coming several days and actually a couple of weeks, I made it my business that on the way to every speech and the way back from every speech, sitting in the hotel room after the speech, waiting for the next morning's flight out somewhere, I try to tackle both the articles and the vocabulary. And the more I read from not people with an interest in alarming us or fundraising against it, just really serious academics, I came to understand the extraordinary scope of drinking water contamination issues. <clears throat> and it, it propelled me exactly as, I, as it had with, with Let There Be Water to raise the alarm uh, and to help people understand this. I, I assumed that it was going to get a very big reaction because one of the truisms about water is that people mostly, not not people who are very good souls and do-gooders like you, Jim, and your staff and the people who are your supporters, but that generally speaking, people care about water only as it affects them. There's a cliche that people in Chicago don't care about the water in Charlotte, and the people in Charlotte don't care about the water in Baltimore. Uh, but nonetheless, when I discovered that drinking water everywhere had contamination issues, that I thought that therefore it might become of more interest to everybody. The book sort of took off. It went through an amazing few weeks. The first book was a New York Times bestseller. The second book, I think, was on the trajectory that did the same. And then COVID hit and everything got canceled. And, and I started doing a bunch of Zoom talks, but that obviously doesn't reach the same numbers of people uh, as you can with large live audience uh, conventions and conferences. So sorry for the long answer, but, but, but that's how I backed into this. And, and, and I'm as passionate about this issue. I have a third, a third leg to my concerns now, is that I've spent the last few years now focused on agriculture. And, and I've written a book about that. I wrote another book in the interim during COVID, uh, but not about water. Um, and um, I, I'm thinking that maybe that will be my next book about how agriculture um, is where we really have to fix what we need to fix if we're going to get our drinking water cleaner, safer, and also because of all the contaminants coming out of agriculture, but also how we're going to fix water scarcity through fixing agriculture. So, so that, that's, that's my story up to the moment. Right. Thank you. And I, let me just... Um also commend this book to, to our audience if you haven't um read it and we 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 do have uh, a batch of these at the watershed institute if you're in a position of coming here and um, purchasing a, a copy but um seth what i what i found i found your book to be a very easy read um you're you're a wonderful storyteller this is not just a book chock full of facts and figures about uh you know, arcane EPA uh, standards and oh God, levels no. of this, that, and the other thing. It's a story about about real people. Um, Jim, actually, can I tell you something? I, yeah. I, 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 first of all, I'm very flattered that you should say that, but I just want to tell you how that came to be. I have a friend who's an op-ed writer for the New York Times, and uh, he, he said to me when I started writing about water, he says, you know, nobody has to read anything you write. And uh, I think he was excluding himself from that. I don't know if he meant himself as well. He says, nobody has to read anything you write. He says, and water is kind of a boring topic. He said, so just keep in mind that any reader can stop reading at any sentence anywhere in the book. Just because they bought the book doesn't mean they have to finish it. They don't have to finish the sentence. They don't have to finish the paragraph. He says, it's on you, not on them, to make wanting the book compelling. So in writing the book, I don't hype anything. I think we could agree. But in writing the book... I very much made a focus on my bullseye target audience was a very smart 11th grader. And whether he or she um, cares for a career in science or technology or, or water it was irrelevant, but I wanted it to be with a vocabulary and a storytelling style that they would be grabbed by it and want to tell it to their friends and such. But I've gotten great compliments from people that the head of the American Water Works Association and heads of utilities and government officials have given me all kinds of good feedback. So thank you, Jim, for that as well. But the, but it wasn't it wasn't an accident that it's easy to read. I figured if I made it homework, if I made it broccoli or spinach, 
I happen to love broccoli and spinach, so I, I know it's a cliche. <laughs> but if, if I made it broccoli or spinach, I feared that nobody would read it. So that's why I didn't make it into a big, boring uh, almanac of facts. Yeah. Well, you do. You bring to life a number of um, issues from lead contamination and plastics to the PFAs, um, PFOAs and PFAs and uh, and pharmaceuticals, right. on, and, on, and, on, and on and on and on. And I hope so. we, I hope we get to talk about pharmaceuticals tonight as well. It's, it's an well. Let's, issue. yeah. Let, let's, let's start right there. We, you know, as you know, this is, um, we're in New Jersey. New Jersey is, is, uh, had some very healthy and and long established um, pharmaceutical companies that have been a big part of the fabric of the state for many years. Um, but we have a serious problem on our hands, don't we? Why, why don't you just? Kind of jump into that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but the problem isn't that the pharmaceutical companies are based in New Jersey, although I, I, I deliberately said pharmaceuticals because I think it's compelling, but also because it's New Jersey. I did say that I was yes. I was catering to you a little bit. Well, <laughs> and let me let me be uh, careful and cautious before I get hate mail from our neighbors. But they, no, you, they, you no, you won't get hate mail from your neighbors. The problem is that is that as we consume the pharmaceuticals and excrete those through our bodily functions, um, those uh, those products are ending up in the, in the water. So maybe maybe explain that a little bit more. So yes, absolutely. Um, I I will precisely. It's not that the pharmaceutical companies are headquartered or their laboratories are headquartered. It's not like they're doing some nefarious yeah. things, dumping things like some mafia story, like in the middle of the night they're dumping all kinds of toxic waste. We have that's zero. another uh, that's another program. <laughs> okay, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> we can have the Sopranos drinking water story. So, um, what what happened? What happened is that when we developed our our methodology for treating wastewater in the United States about a hundred years ago, we were addressing society's issues and level of science knowledge at the time. And the great concern then was basically smelly, unsightly poop. And the fact that people were dumping all kinds of things like dead horses in their in the wastewater stream and, and things of that sort. And so they developed all kinds of regulation to prohibit dumping of waste into waterways. And then in terms of the wastewater treatment plants, they first had just what's called primary treatment, which got rid of the smelly stuff and the unsightly stuff. And that was driven to some degree by real estate interests. Interesting. It wasn't by science or health. It was driven by real estate interests who were concerned about the idea of being able to sell waterfront property. Because once upon a time, waterfront property was like the worst property because it was where all this stuff was dumped. And then waterfront property became beautiful and real estate interests understood how great it could be if we could get it clean and odor free. So about 100 years ago, they started dealing with primary treatment. Then they, around World War II, a little bit after that, they started adding secondary treatment, uh, which makes the water yet cleaner and better. In 1972, uh, the federal government passes the Clean Water Act. And the Clean Water Act addresses what you have to do, a wastewater treatment plant has to do, before dumping its water uh, and to clean it to a certain level. And even at that point, the government could have and should have addressed the pharmaceutical problem, but they didn't. But even then, it wasn't really at the level it is today. Nowadays, this is a shocking statistic, and I try not to do too many statistics, but a shocking one nonetheless, that 60% of Americans 18 and over consume um, one or more prescription pills a day, and 20% of Americans 18 and over consume five or more prescription pills a day. So that's, a that's mountains and mountains, billions of pills consumed per week for sure. And as Jim just said, after a few hours, whether you sweat it out or pee it out or otherwise exit your body, whether it goes out of your toilet or your shower or your, or your washing machine, one way or another, all those 90 to 95% of the active ingredient of the pharmaceutical never hits any part of the body, it leaves your body, it gets into the wastewater stream. And the wastewater treatment plants have no capacity, except in a, one or two rare communities, which I write about in the book, have no capacity for extracting those active agents in the, in the wastewater stream. And they can be completely compliant with the law. And I hope we are left with a thought tonight, which is that you can be completely legal, completely compliant with the law and still not be safe. And I'm not trying to be an alarmist. I'm just trying to provoke better, better behaviors and better regulation. So what then happens is the water gets into a river or a lake. 
it's discharged. It's discharged fully legally, we'll say, although there are about 80,000 violations of the, of the Drinking Water Acts every year, but we'll put that aside. Let's assume everything is totally kosher and legal. And then what happens is, I apologize for uh, my daughter's dog is uh, greeting somebody at the front door. I apologize for that. Uh, but what ends up happening is, is that those active ingredients linger in the water. They are made to be durable. You don't buy something from the pharma pharmacy and it goes bad as quickly as, you know, as a tomato or a banana. It's made to be durable. It's made to be, it's made to last sometimes years. It's made, it's made to be sunlight resistant and it gets into the water, it gets into the water flow. And then from there, it stays there. But then what happens is someone downriver or elsewhere in that same lake then extracts the water for drinking water supply and what do they do? They don't put it through reverse osmosis. They do something, actually started in New Jersey. I tell the story about it. It's a great story from Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, which was in, not invented in New Jersey, but it was perfected in New Jersey. Um, and they add a little bit of chlorine or some other disinfectant agent to the water so that you're not e drinking something that'll give you cholera or dysentery. And that's really good news. That's important. But it does nothing to address the pharmaceutical agents. Now, why is that concerning? It's concerning because we are almost all of us ingesting a cocktail of pharmaceuticals. When the FDA approves a, a, a drug, they're approving it for a specific type of person, a specific condition, for a specific dosage and a specific length of time that should be taken. But now we're having these micro doses of pharmaceutical agents that come in. They're a cocktail. It's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and it comes together. And for most of us, it maybe has no effect. But for fetuses, for newborns, for very elderly people, for people on chemotherapy, for people who are, who are immunosuppressed, it can and has been shown to cause all kinds of side effects. And this is very concerning. I just want to say one last thing, because it's a very compelling story in the book. Um, I, I, I tell the story of a professor from uh, University of Buffalo, a, a very esteemed scientist, who was curious to take a, chem a chemical that could only be found from pharmaceutical agents and not from nature. And what she tested for, she got a grant from the US government to test the fish in the five Great Lakes. And she found that more than half of all the fish, regardless of species, regardless of weight, regardless of age, more than half of the fish had in their brains, in their muscles, and in their organs, lots of Zoloft and Celexa and all other kinds of psychodynamic drugs that will either make you happier or a little slower or a little faster, or a little less schizophrenic. And these drugs got into the waters of the Great Lakes, which are vast, which means that a lot of it got in there because it could be concentrated in so many fish, or, or fish's organs and brains. It got in there even after it had left the wastewater treatment plant where it had entered before getting into the Great Lakes. So, so it's, it says something very significant that surely in smaller bodies of water, we are having yet more uh, concentration of these pharmaceutical agents. Seth, you you said something very poignant in the book uh, that you know our, our our drugs come with labels that warn us against taking them in combination with other substances or not getting behind the wheel and driving after you take them, but our but our tap water doesn't. And you know for <laughs> for people that are de dependent on these. Um, medicines but need to resist you know really avoid taking them in combination with other substances i you know, potentially there's quite a quite a problem so um and and let me just add book before we leave the issue of pharmaceuticals um one thing we can do that's really easy to at least uh, address perhaps a small part of the problem um is not dispose of these medicines by dumping them down the toilet, which is something that uh, I, I, I didn't grow up in a household that did that, but I'm told that's a very common yes. practice. And I, you know, I, I'm not sure what the net result of that is um, versus some other impacts, but certainly- but, but, but Jim, to be clear, I write about that in, in Troubled Water, but to be clear about that, the it's not an insignificant number of pills and there are some disposal programs. But there are two, two things to be said about that. For, first is it's a very small percentage of the total that we are you know, getting out the pills that are being used the way it should be used, and then we excrete them. But second of all is the alternative that many people use is they then crush it or they throw it out in their trash. And the problem with that is that it, although it takes longer, 
to affect us. It's, we are finding all kinds of, and I talk about four or five studies that were done in New England, um, it, it, very, very problematically, um, it, 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 it oozes out of our wastewater, uh, outside of our landfills and gets into drinking water. It takes longer to get there, but, but nonetheless, it gets there, it gets there the same. So we have, to, we, have, we, have to, we have to develop a kind of an off switch. I mean, what, what I posit in the, in the book, and which is scientifically possible, is that after a certain period of time, the pill is made inert, and the active ingredient is, is it's called mineralization of it. It turns back to inert uh, characteristics. So what should people at home, what, what should the takeaway be if you have unused medications What's what's the best? Well, thing if do? if you if you if you're lucky enough to live near one of the national chain stores, they all now have take back programs, and they then incinerate it. Uh, at least they're supposed to, but I'm told that it's pretty rigorously followed. Uh, they then have a monthly burn where they take it from all over the country. They open up all the plastic containers and they dump you know millions of pills into an inferno. They burn it and they make it inert and they take the ash and they containerize the ash and then they put that into a landfill. So that's that's a couple of steps better, several steps better than what's going on right now. Yes, do not flush it down your toilet. It is, it is the worst thing you can do. Don't All sell right. it on, don't sell the, don't sell them on eBay and don't flush it down the toilet. <laughs> um, Seth, you, you're, uh, you're very critical of our system of utilities in this country, this staggering numbers um, that the poor regulation, the, the lack of funding, let's, maybe let's talk about that a little bit. And, sure. um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on consolidation. And for that matter, on something that's, that's very controversial. And, and we had a, an issue of this that came up and, and was defeated, but privatization of, of public, uh, water systems. So let's do privatization second. Okay. Let's put that yeah. aside. And, but please remind me, cause I have obviously strong opinion about mm -hmm. that. Um, I, I actually, why don't I start with privatization so I can get everybody nice and angry with me. Um, I, 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 I am a completely agnostic as to who should own uh, the water utility. It could be a foundation. It could be, um, it could be um, uh, a utility, obviously, the, I'm sorry, utility owned by the community as a co-op. Uh, it could be a private company. Uh, two things I would say about that. First is that it is always terrible not always, is, is mostly terrible when a utility is, is owned by an entity that is controlled by an elected official. And, and that what we need to know about that is that elected officials do not like to raise taxes or anything that's seen as a tax. And therefore, they keep water prices generally, not universally, but generally at lower than the correct price. But the effect of that is not that the water is just kept lower price. It's just there's less water, less, I'm sorry, less money in the system to improve the system, to fix broken pipes, to buy new technology, to get filtration equipment at a highest level so that you can get the contaminants out of the system. So that, that, that's, the, that's the singularly greater problem about, uh, about political ownership. The second thing I wanted to say was about that before I get into the utility proliferation is that there are academic studies, and, uh, and again, I said I'm completely agnostic as to who should own it, other than that I don't think an elected official should be controlling the pricing, um, but that there are, there are academic studies uh, about this which demonstrate that privately owned utilities have far lower levels of health code violations, of, of drinking water, Safe Drinking Water Act viol health violations than do um, utilities owned by municipalities. Now, I've been I, I, the, the the critique against that is that is that the privately owned utilities tend to be in more affluent communities and they have more money to fix their problems. But the professor who did most of these studies, somebody a, a woman I admire very much, um, claims that she's controlled for all of those variables and she still finds the same thing. So I, I, I present the story in my book and I, I leave people to make their own conclusion about privatization. Again, I, I I do not care at all whether it's owned or not owned by. An individual or a company or 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 a uh, foundation, but I but I, I do think that we need to be thinking about who's who's who, who's deciding on what we pay for it. Okay, so the problem about about the number of utilities, and I wish this was a live audience, and you know if this was six months from now and COVID were really over, maybe you would have invited me to tonight's event live. One of the things I love to do before COVID hit and stopped me from speaking live before audiences 
So I used to love to say to audiences, okay, we have 50 states, 48 of them contiguous. What would you say, I would say to the audience, what would you say would be a reasonable number that we should have to control our water utilities? And audiences would sometimes say 50, one for every state. And sometimes they would say 40, you know, because there were some small states. And some would say, yeah, but there's some very big states too. So 65 and occasionally you get to 100 or 200. And very rarely, very, very rarely, the bidding, as I used to call it, would get up to 400. That was as high as it ever went. No one ever got higher than 400 in the dozens and dozens of times I did this, this parlor trick in front of audiences. And then I would pause and then I would share with the audience that the actual number is 51,535 utilities in the United States. An incredibly horrible number. And although it gives great reasons for local pride and for local autonomy, it certainly guarantees that the vast majority of all utilities will not have the assets they need to build out and continue to improve the, whether it's the wastewater facility they have or the drinking water facility they have, or, or sometimes it's combined into one, because they just don't have the money, they don't have the rate base, they can't attract enough staff, they can't pay high enough salaries, they can't fill positions when they get empty, there's not enough staff redundancy. And so they end up finding themselves in all kinds of problems as a result of that. And, and it's not surprising that the largest percentage of those 80,000 annual uh, health violations of the Safe Drinking Water Act come from communities that have smaller utilities or sometimes within a community that they have a small number. There are an incomprehensibly large number of utilities. In Los Angeles County alone, there are over 200 drinking water utilities. Now, there's a lot of reasons how that came to be. Glad to answer it uh, through the Q&A or otherwise. But what it means is that not only don't they have the money to do what they have to do, not only do they not have the, the, um, the talent that they could attract, but it also means that when, and we're seeing this increasingly around the world, when the cyber criminals or, or Iran or North Korea want to create mayhem for the United States, what they can do is they can, through cyber warfare, they can just take over one or more of these utilities. It's happened now on a couple of occasions. We don't know if it's, we don't know if it's criminals or if it's, or if it's state actors, but we know it's happened. Uh, in Israel, uh, the, one of the water utilities attempted to be taken over was by Iran. It was traced back to them. So we know that they are not above trying to poison uh, civilians through their water supply. And this is something that you cannot, when you have 51,000 plus utilities, you cannot develop enough cyber controls and enough cyber training for all the people who have to be involved. You can only do it when you have highly consolidated utilities. And that's the reason why for health and safety and finance, and the best outcome possible, I am a strong advocate for, a, and I give a plan for how to do it, for a, a radical consolidation program in the United States. So what, what's the right number? I, I personally think the right number should be somewhere in the vicinity of 75 to 125. Yeah. And, and there's also no reason why you can't have a utility that, that straddles more than one state. Um, it, 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 that just doesn't make any sense. I mean, if, if the states, different states have different regulatory regimes, fine. <laughs> That's fine. How hard is that? I mean, you, you hire some smart lawyers and smart paralegals, you know what the regulatory regime is and you enforce it as it is. But, you know, there's a lot of big companies that do business in more than one state and they somehow are the figure that are highly regulated industries. They somehow are the figure out how to, how to do their work and, and not run too far afoul of the laws in every county or every state or every or every nation for that matter. So, Seth, so I'm going to I'm going to tell a little corollary story to that and this is more about land use regulation than than water regulation or where the two combine. So I, this was early in my time here so late 2000s um, one of our convenience stores um, wanted to put in a, a a set of gas pumps and the location happened to be very close to the neighboring municipalities um, main source of drinking water, which was a big public well. And it got so complicated because the, the town whose water supply was threatened, it was a little town called Rocky Hill, was threatened by a potential land use in the neighboring municipality of Montgomery Township. Eventually, both towns had to had to adopt an ordinance called a wellhead, protect, wellhead protection ordinance that had to be approved by DEP and they were able to prevent the, the gas pumps from going in. So I, 
you, you talk about these huge number of utilities. We also have a huge number of governmental entities making land use decisions, sometimes and often impacting their neighbor and their neighbor's drinking water. So, the, the, well, you know, you know, we, we didn't talk about, I, we, I said 51,000 plus utilities, but we didn't talk about the fact that there's another over 120,000 other water entities in the United States, churches, campgrounds, universities, um, and so okay. forth that have, that are their own, that are their own water district. I didn't mention the fact that not New Jersey, but out West, and I'm doing a lot of work out West now, there are so many irrigation districts and flood control districts and so forth that deeply, deeply affect the quality of groundwater. Um, so, so we, we, you, nobody would design a system that we have like this. And what I like to say to public officials, and I've been honored because of my books, to many governors and state legislatures as well as federal legislatures around the world is our water regulations are not from God. You know, these are man-made regimes and people put, and I, I use man-made in the vernacular of both genders, but uh, these, these are people-made regimes and we, in the same way that we created them because we were addressing a series of problems at the time we created these regimes, we can create new regimes that address the problems and the health needs of the generation we're in right now. And what the problem is, is that whether it's utilities or other, and I, I, I'm not a conspiracist, so I hate the phrase special interests, you know, but, but people who have a vested interest in the status quo are not very keen on seeing changes because they know what they have right now and they don't know what they're going to have in the new new approach. And they're really kind of resistant to having that. And that's, by the way, that's another reason why I love the Watershed Institute, because of the fact that you guys are speaking to public officials. You are, you guys are, again, using guys in generic gender-free sense. I, I'm, I, everyone's very sensitive these days. So I apologize. I'm, a, I'm an old guy and I learned how to speak English a long time ago. So I have some saying, but, but, you know, what you all are doing uh, is exactly what has to be done. You're educating the public and you're, and you're speaking to public officials and sooner or later that those are going to coalesce around the idea of it's time for some changes in the way we're doing business because we have to change the way we do business. Thank you, Seth. I, you know, another, um, I will call them your whipping boys in your book. You may not <laughs> want to let that stand, but, um, is the, is the U S EPA. And, uh, I, I, I have a lot of friends that work at the EPA, but I'm not going to say I disagree with your, uh, your your judgment, but maybe talk a little bit about just the overwhelming challenge and how uh, how how that agency is done. In you know, I, 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 don't, I don't. I by the way, whipping boy implies sort of like I'm being unfair to them because that's <laughs> you know that whipping boy historically the whipping boy was a, a person in the royal court who because the prince could not be whipped they would bring somebody else out and they would whip him in lieu of whipping the prince so so somebody who was innocent got got faulted by the way that's my grandson background uh wire getting wired up for uh, bedtime so i apologize if you're hearing that in the background uh uh you know this is the zoom life we're living no one's in an office hardly anymore so you have dogs you have grandchildren you have life all around you uh but but you know so 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 the epa in my view is not a whipping boy uh, or, or, or whipping person, if I think they'd be called now. Uh, but, um, but I, I, I love telling the story. It actually happened in New Jersey. Um, uh, shortly after Troubled Water came out, um, I was making a speech to a, a community in, in New Jersey at a, uh, at a big uh, facility. And I don't know, maybe 150 people from the community had turned out for the evening. And um, during the Q&A, a, a woman stands up and she says, I want to say something. And she sounded like she was angry. And I thought I was, was going to get yelled at. She said, I am a, I just retired a few weeks ago from a long career at the EPA. And she said, and I want everyone to know, and I'm thinking, oh God, I'm going to get, I'm going to get hit or something now. And she said, I want everyone to know, she pauses and she, she, the veins are popping in her neck. I want everyone to know that Seth Siegel has understated the problem, <laughs> so 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 I felt kind of validated. But but my comments about the EPA are not just something that I came up with a bias. The book was deeply researched. I interviewed many many. I mean, interviewed over two hundred people for the book. I'm sorry, uh, I did over two hundred interviews for the book. I interviewed over one hundred twenty five people for the book, and um, 
And, and, and I list them, except for five people who are currently at the EPA and need to be anonymous, I list them all in the back of the book so you can see who they are and what they do. And, and it's from their own testimonies that I came to the conclusion about the EPA. And the problem about the EPA is it's not the people who work there. These people are hardworking, smart, very decent uh, uh, federal employees. The problem is the mandate that Congress has given them and the limitation of authority that they have. So for example, there are more than 100,000 chemicals that are legally in commerce in the United States right now. 55,000 of them, by the way, are just pharmaceuticals. There are over 100,000, there, 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 100, um, uh, there are over 100,000 chemicals in commerce in the United States. And um, when you think about this, you would say to yourself, well, the EPA surely is regulating 25,000, 75,000. I mean, I don't know, some number in that realm but it's not tr true. And again, we could play that same parlor game and ask the audience what they think would be the logical number. Well, it turns out there were barely a hundred agents of any kind that are regulated for water by the EPA. And of those, when you take away the radiological, the nuclear and the, and the, um, uh, and the uh, other, other types of other categories of, of contaminants, we come to about 70 chemicals that the EPA currently regulates for our drinking water. And as shocking as that was to me when I came out, I couldn't believe it when I first discovered that number. Because somebody who worked for the EPA said that to me, uh, a very, very gifted uh, scientist, a woman um, uh, who recently retired, so I guess I could share her name now, I guess. But um, what was more shocking to me was that I went back and I decided to track the order and the date of every contaminant that had been regulated and what the reasoning was and how it came to be regulated. And what I discovered to my shock is that the last time the EPA regulated any chemical was more than 25 years ago. Now, it can't be that in our highly industrialized society, it can't be with all the P PFAS chemicals, PFOA, PFOS, and the couple of thousand others that are their progeny. It can't possibly be that there hasn't been a single new chemical that's a threat to society in 25 years that the EPA couldn't regulate. And I go into the, again, it's not a whipping boy, but I go into how it came to be. The EPA does very little in terms of regulation because Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, everyone thinks it's just the Republicans, but it's not. It's both parties. They have a vested interest in seeing to it that the EPA does not get more aggressive in drinking water. And the reason for that is because we're going back to what I said before. Mayors and governors do not want to see, whether you're Democrat or Republican, you do not want to see your water prices rising. It's politically a loser, and you don't want to see it. So the mayor says to his cousin or his friend who's the local congressman, or the governor says to his friend who's the senator, you got to shield me on this one, make sure nothing happens here. So it's not like they pass legislation that affirmatively stops it, to just make sure that nothing happens. Everything gets gummed up. Finance and budgeting for EPA gets gummed up and nothing ever happens to move things forward. And that's the problem that I'm identifying. How do we break that? And one of the solutions that I come up with is that we should turn it out of the EPA and turn it over to Health and Human Services so at least there'd be the aura of it being health-driven. Because right now the EPA currently, currently, not in the Trump years, in the Democratic years. Currently, the EP has not does not see itself as primarily a health mandate, but it sees itself as an operational mandate to get water out to the public. And that's what I complain about. We need more research. We need more spending. We need smarter regulation. So I'm going to back up and, and go back to what we were talking about um, from, a, from a different angle in a sec. But I, I do want to uh, let folks know if you're if you're on um, either the platforms that this is being um, streamed on, you can go ahead and, and submit a question and I'll be able to read it and, and ask. And, Seth and, Jim, and Jim, I'd like to throw out another phenomenon, which is if somebody's yep. not live watching us now, water work is my life. Um, I do this as, a, as, as, a, as you do. I'm a passionate advocate for the issue. Um, and um, I would invite anybody at any time, if you're live tonight watching this or you're watching this a month or a year from now, I would urge you to get in touch with me if you have a question. 
And you can reach me at my website, which is www.seth, S-E-T-H-M, like Mary Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L.com, or via Twitter at at Seth M. Siegel. And, um, and, and maybe, Jim, you can, on the show notes or whatever you have, you can add that to how people can reach me. Um, I, I, anybody who contacts me, I do my best to respond to every email within 24 hours. And uh, again, uh, this is my life's work. This is a passion. It's not what I do for pay. It's what I do for passion. Thank you so much. I'm sure people will appreciate that. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions from um, some, some friends and colleagues. So, so let me ask you a couple of those. The first comes from um, one of my drinking water heroes, which is a, a man named Bob Harris. Um, Bob served on the board of trustees here at the, at the Watershed Institute. Um, but back in the early 70s, it was a young scientist working for uh, Ralph Nader and uh, was instrumental in pulling the reports together that became the Consumer Report Series that went to Congress in 1974 during that, that big, uh, very successful wave. But um, Bob was telling me that the, initially the Safe Drinking Water Act, there was a fair amount of thinking that didn't really get followed. Um, that instead of chasing chemical, one chemical at a time, and, and you've, you've described how dismal the record has been of adding additional uh, chemicals to the list of regulated compounds, um, but to s instead uh, approach it from a, um, a, a methodology of treatment standpoint. So uh, activated carbon filtration, for example, which, um, are thought to be highly successful in addressing a suite of chemicals and that that might have been a better approach that if it were pursued than waiting for the uh, the political system to catch up yeah with the science. I, I, i'm with bob i'm with bob on that i'm with yeah. bob on that you know R R ralph actually contacted me after troubled water came out it was really very sweet i mean for those of us who care about consumer issues ralph is you know I was in high school when Unsafe at Any Speed came out, which is his first mm -hmm. book. And um, I, I have to say, to some extent, I, I, he and I disagree on, on a, a whole bunch of issues, particularly, you know, with the, the role of privatization, the role of, of corporations in solving the problems. We disagree on those things. But, but Ralph has been a great supporter of Troubled Water. He reached, me, he reached out to me when it came out, and he, he, he greatly thanked me for what he did. The other thing he disagrees with me about is he, he, he thinks that basically all congressmen are rats. And yeah, that's the word he used, <laughs> and that none of them can be trusted. And my attitude is rats are not rats. I can't say, it's not for me to say, it's not for me to judge. That's who's there. That's the ones who have the power and we got to work with who's there and let's let's work with them and let's not no, name call there. But but Ralph and what Nader's Raiders have done are really just extraordinary for consumer rights. Um, and I agree with Bob. I agree with Bob about his analysis about drinking water. Uh, we, we could have dealt with this systemically and what we deal with it mostly is as we lurch crisis to crisis and community to community, we don't want to have a we don't want to have a systemic solution to this problem. You you describe uh, an example of a of a region and a governmental body that um, seems to have gotten it, if not right, they've 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 done it a lot better than 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 the balance. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about what Orange County has done right. I know that's a long story, but uh, dive in where you think. Well, there, 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 are, yeah. there, are, there are two very bright examples that I give. And the reason I did that, by the way, uh, Jim, uh, was the reason I did that was I didn't want the reader to come away with a feeling of, well, it's hopeless or it's just bad news. I wanted the reader to understand that indeed, and with, with, with my first book about water scarcity, the reason I gave Israel as the example was here's a country in the driest region of the world, fast growing population, dynamic economy. And they are so water rich that they share their water with their neighbors in Pal the Palestinian Authority and in Jordan. I wanted to show how everyone could be like them. And, and likewise, likewise with, with our drinking water in America, I wanted everyone to understand that we could be more like the UK and we, in some ways, and we could be more like Orange County. And both of them quickly. Right? The, the UK, once upon a time, had hundreds and hundreds of countries at that time, about 40 million people. Now it's 65, 70 million people. But at the time, they had hundreds and hundreds of water utilities. Every little community had a water utility, just like America. Um, maybe not quite as, as densely populated with utilities, but too many. And they made a decision to consolidate their drinking water uh, utilities 
and to privatize them as well, but to privatize them and regulate the heck out of them and to give them all kinds of very severe metrics and very heavy penalties if any of them missed on any of their metrics. And that system has worked really, really well. Now, the price of water has risen, as I believe it should, actually, but with subsidies for families that were poor or indigent, uh, I think that's the right approach. Um, but the quality has gone up very significantly. The case of Orange County is a little bit different. They were facing an environmental catastrophe with seawater encroachment into their water supply and doesn't have time to go into all of it here because it's a, it a whole chapter of the book, but a very, I, to my mind, fascinating story of how they did this. But what they did do was they ended up spending a gigantic sum of money, hundreds of millions of dollars to create was probably the best water system in the United States, clean water, um, safe water, constantly searching for other contaminants, contaminant free drinking water. And, um, and their attitude about it is, is that this is sort of like a, a, a mission, I'm not just here to, to just serve out the water. The, the attitude there was we are here to guard the health of our community. And the big takeaway of the story, to my mind, was the way that the utility engaged with the community. And Jim, I would challenge anyone watching tonight or anyone watching this later to tell me when was the last time, unless they work for utility, when was the last time, other than their bill, that the utility reached out to them to educate them about what the utility is doing and invite them into the process and to systematically talk about it? And what Orange County did and continues to do is they have a highly transparent system. They reach out to community at all levels, the media and elected officials and public servants and ministers and priests and rabbis and imams and and uh, local schools and local school teachers and local community colleges, and they take it upon themselves to educate everybody about what they are doing with their water and why the water needs to be a little bit more expensive than everywhere else. And you know what? They also do polling, which almost no utility in America has ever done, public or private, and as my research showed. And what ended up happening is, is that they people, no one wants to pay more just to pay more, but nobody will resent paying more if they understand they're getting more. And that's what Orange County finally proved to, uh, to me, at least, which was that when you give more, you can charge more and you can have uh, very, very high levels of satisfaction. And that's the other thing that they got because of the education, the quality, and even with the higher pricing, they're able to get very, very good reaction from their consumer base. And that's something that I think every, every utility should be thinking about. Thank you. Um, Seth, another uh, name you might know uh, is my predecessor here at the Watershed Institute, George Hawkins. Oh, I love um, George. George, yeah. uh, of course, ran the Washington, D.C. water utility for years. Um, and so he, he sent a question in. He's um, wondering your thoughts about the, the big infrastructure bill that the Congress has adopted last year and the massive amount of funds that are coming. And is that, um, I will add to his question and ask, is that, is that another way to go? If we have enough federal money pouring in with that. Yeah, but by the way, George, George is a great hero. He was a source for, for my book. He helped educate me about it. Um, because you can't, can't quote everybody. I ended up not having a quote from him <laughs> in the book. I, 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 but I told him I'd make it up to him. So in the, the third book, the book that came out last May, I, uh, I made sure that George would be quoted in that book. And so I'm very happy that uh, I got a chance to recognize George. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy, a brilliant fellow, by the way. Um, so, you know, again, I, I'm, 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 I, I prefer that, that people should have skin in the game. I prefer that people should be paying for their own water and not buying others to it. But however we do it, we should do it. That said, lots of our war problems are not of our making. They're of generations ago's making. And in that situation, I think it's, it's totally appropriate for, for, um, for, for there to be you know, federal institutional money. And the fact that it's a lot of money is good. What's really good, and we have a whole chapter in the book about lead, uh, lead service lines and lead pipes. Uh, what I think is really good, and I really applaud the administration for this, is... Um, is that they um, are, are attempting to tackle um, uh, lead pipes and lead pipe removal uh, over time horizon with a, with a significant uh, dollar spending. Uh, 
I, I will add for you an interesting historical note. When Troubled Water came out, um, I, I was invited. I, I forget who it was who read it in the White House, but somebody at a fairly senior level read the book and reached out to me and asked me if I would consider coming up to uh, the White House. And I didn't really, you know, you know, I'd really try to not let politics get in the way of, of my policy issues. I think whatever we need to do to get solutions is the best thing to do and to not demonize anyone and to work with anybody who's prepared to work with you. I hope and think that the Watershed Institute takes the same attitude. Um, in fact, I know you do. Uh, but um, so I, I found myself at the White House and at the, I made a presentation of what the book was about, uh, White House senior staff. And they asked me at a day or two later if I could come up with a, a, a three or four or five points of things that could be addressed in the near term that they wished, that I wished they would do and that could be politically palatable. And number, I came back to them, I came back a few weeks later and I presented uh, my plan. And number one on that list was lead pipe removal in the United States. And they, this is totally lost to history, but they decided to go forward with it. They were going to adopt it. And they were going to announce it in May of 2020. Um, and of course, COVID slightly got in the way of that. Uh, but, um, but, you know, but, but lots of things got disrupted by COVID, but but it's really kind of a shame that we lost several years of, uh, of forward motion uh, that we could have that we could have had um, uh, on fixing our water issues uh, via uh, via this plan. That they were prepared to pre prepared to spend a great deal of money um, and to announce it at a big gala event, uh, as I said, in May of, of 2020, which of course it never happened. But but it, it's one of those counterfactual things that almost could have been. So um, let me turn to a couple of questions that have come in through the uh, comment uh, feature. Um, we have a couple of Sarahs that have asked questions. Um, one but, of them but is- But Jim, are uh, they Sarahs with H's or Sarahs without H's at the end? There's there's one with an H and one without an H. Okay, so let's do it in alphabetical order. Let's do the Sarah without the H first. <laughs> okay, uh, wait a minute, where am I? So Sarah without the H asks a very good question. What can I do? Oh, I love that question. Well, first of all, um, follow, the, follow the model of the Watershed Institute is what I would say. First of all, educate yourself. Get smart on the issue. You don't have to be as smart as a scientist who knows everything. In fact, you don't have to know everything even if you're a policy person. You just have to know enough that you can start talking about it with a little self-confidence, not a lot of self-confidence, and what you need to do is start talking about it with friends, start talking about it with local media, make an appointment to speak to the editor of your local newspaper, find out what's going on in your local community, get, make an appointment to go to your local water utility to talk to them about what's going on with their water. They won't go out to meet you, but they will meet you if you call them and say you want to talk to them. Um, and then once you start to feel you have some compelling sense of what's going on in your community, and certainly with the book Trouble Water will give you a roadmap for what you can talk about on a national scale. Make an appointment to see any one of your local representatives, whether it's a congressman or a senator, someone in the governor's office, your local mayor, local city council person, as low or as high as you would like. And I want to tell you why. With a very few exceptions, very, very few elected officials at a, at a national level know very much about water and drinking water. And the reason for that is as logical is that they don't come to office from a water track. They come as DAs, they come as state assemblymen, they come as, uh, they, they come, you know, as, as, as mayors, as DAs, you know, other jobs like that, that, that don't track necessarily in the water realm. And um, we have one year as the water commissioner of his state, but that, that's a rare entity. And, what I've discovered is that when you talk to an elected official one time about something, or you're the only person who talks about it, they'll say thank you very much. They'll nod their head sagely. They'll take some notes, maybe, and that will be that. If you make an appointment to come back and see them a month later, and you should, because that's what citizen activism is all about. It's not a one and done. It's an ongoing educational process. You go back and you talk to them a second time, a third time, a fifth time, a 20th time. What you're going to discover is that they're gonna look forward to seeing you because you're gonna be providing them with important information. But 
if you can get two other people to also call that elected official and to meet with that elected official separately, what you're going to discover to your utter joy and amazement is that that elected official is going to be, get very smart on the issue. Because elected officials do not like to be embarrassed. And so what they will end up doing is appointing a staffer to be on top of the issue so that the next time you or one of your colleagues comes in to see him or her, they are going to know what they should be talking about and they will be start talking to you about solutions. I have seen this again and again and again. And then finally, the last thing you can do is partner with very worthy organizations and identify several of them in my book. Um, and you can and you can ask them for legislative ideas and local policy ideas that you can bring, or you can contact me for that matter, uh, that you can bring to your specific community, something that needs fixing in your area. It could be PFAS, it could be lead, it could be, uh, it could be uh, water treatment, it could be leaky pipes. There's lots of different things that, that uh, it could be in your local community, but it differs community by community. So I'll tell you a very similar story. I'll try to tell it quickly, but I, before coming to the watershed, I was, uh, uh, environmental lobbyist for national groups for 15 years down in Washington. And I, I had a chief of staff once tell me that if we could get five letters into the office, that would change how his boss would vote on an issue. It was getting squeezed from one of his colleagues in Congress and otherwise didn't have a reason not to vote with his friend or his buddy who was trying to squeeze him to get something else. So it really does make a difference. You, you, I, you want to know something? I once went to lobby a, a U.S. senator from Colorado. And who's not in office anymore. Um, a very nice and extremely intelligent individual who I came to know and came to like and respect greatly. And th this person, um, I asked him for specific, it wasn't water related, I asked him for specific policy uh, fix. And he said, I don't know. He says, I'm getting flooded with letters, flooded with letters on this topic. He says, I, I really just don't know if I can yield to you on that. He says, I'm going to pay a big political price for this. So I said to him, and he and I knew each other well enough I could say it uh, without any disrespect. I said, uh, Senator, can you just give me a sense of what are those letters saying? Can, can, can I see them? I won't contact the people. He says, sure. He says, he calls that to an 80. He says, bring me the file on such and such. He brings me the file. There were three letters, three letters. I said, Senator, this is a flood. He says, three, this is from a whole state of Colorado. He says, three people took the time and trouble to write a letter. You think I can ignore this? <laughs> so that was a flood to him. So it yeah. just tells you how correct my, my point of view is that if you're talking to a mayor or assembly or, or state senator, you can get three of your friends, five of your friends to come and talk at different times and to send letters. Oh my God, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have your you're, you're gonna have the, the 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 elected official eating out of your hand. Um, Seth, can and, you, and, by, can and, by the, and by the way, I, I do have to say this. Do not, if you're a Democrat, which I think most people in the drinking water space are, do not refuse to talk to Republicans. As I write in my book, the problem with drinking water is that it's seen, unfortunately, as an environmental issue, but it should be seen as a public health issue. And so there is an environmental aspect to it all. Obviously, watershed purity and so forth is clearly environmental. But what I have learned from my many, many, many meetings with Republican elected officials is that they are only to talk about solutions that can politically, palatably sell, and they are not going to throw you out of their office. Educate them too. Don't be shy. Talk to anybody, uh, anybody who can help affect your agenda. Don't think it's a one-party solution. It's not ever. It's a great point. Um, can you hang with us for another 10 minutes or so, Seth? Is that? Uh, yes, I can. I, why don't okay, we say so like 7, uh, we'll, we'll we say 7 15? Uh, also, I don't, want to uh, I don't want to make the tedious for the audience, but yes, sure, of course. Okay. So we'll go back to Sarah without the H. <laughs> um, and she was asking about, uh, you know, the essence of her question is if, if EPA is such a tough slog, um, can we make progress through state environmental? Environmental yes. Yeah, I'll give a very sense? I'll give a very short answer. In fact, the the federal law enabling the EPA, in fact, is, it specifically anticipates that question. And what it says is that no state can have environmental regulations that are less strenuous than the EPA, but that actually every state has the right to make it more strenuous. And I, I, I didn't think we we're going to get into this, and I'm going to get into in the weeds here. But actually, I talk about this in the book a little bit, which is that. One of the ways in which uh, sometimes environmental regulation gets passed, and since Frank Lautenberg was the 
senator from New Jersey, I guess I could mention this, the Lautenberg Environmental Act, got get, how does it get passed? What ends up happening is, it's not exactly on point about water, but it's not that far away from it. How does it get passed? It gets passed because the feds refuse to act and the individual states are passing individual chemical industry regulation. And the chemical industry starts to freak out. Oh my God, what are we going to do? We're going to have to have 50 different sets of regulatory approaches which you have 50 different kinds of packaging, 50 different kinds of packaging notices. What are we going to do here? And the, the, the industry ends up going to Congress and saying to Congress, we need a federal fix on this thing. So it's actually kind of a, a fun idea that if the feds won't fix it themselves, and then so Congress ended up fixing it and compelling, compelling to some degree EPA what to do. But if the feds won't fix it, state by state regulation is a terrific way to go Either you'll get a better solution just for your state, or more likely, as other states start to get in the game, you'll either create a new standard or you'll get the industry freaked out and they're going to come to, to their, the powers that be and say, save us and let's come up with a new standard that we all can live with. Uh, and the state of New Jersey is, is a great example of that. You know, way ahead of EPA in setting standards for uh, PFAs, you know, that you, you talk in the book about the, the push and pull and back and forth over the arsenic standard. Um, New Jersey, I think, is at five. The you know, it took forever. Instead, for the, instead of 15, for right. EPA, yep. So, and, and so that's, yeah. an, that's an example. The federal standard is 15 uh, yeah. for the levels of, of arsenic permitted in the water. But uh, there are states that are five, and New Jersey is one of them. And so that's it. It's five. Yeah. And that's good. And, that, that means that means now, by the way, it's easier for New Jersey to do that because you have much less arsenic naturally occurring in your drinking water. So it was easier for you to pass that uh, out yeah. west where there's a lot of arsenic in the in the soil and in the water supply. Guess what? You know, the in, the uh, utilities there were very happy to have 15 as the standard. Seth, I will say we have we have a ridge of very high arsenic levels on a kind of Western side of the state of New Jersey, including where we are. So that is, okay. um, Thank it wasn't, you. Live and learn. it wasn't complete slammed up. Yeah. We'll, we'll, I'll talk to you again another time about arsenic in like New that. Jersey. Um, but, and I want to add that, um, one of the great things about not all, but a number of New Jersey's environmental statutes is they take that same model that you described Seth, where states can be stronger than the federal government. Well, a lot of the state regulations, authorize very explicitly municipalities to be stronger than the state regs. So we work with a lot of towns on on their stormwater ordinances, on their um, stream buffers, you know, requiring setbacks from streams. Yep. And we've had a lot of success, you know, with a lot of great um, local activism at getting at least some of the municipalities to, to adopt much stronger uh, standards. I think the question that should be asked is how do we get a watershed institute in every one of the 50 states? But, but <laughs> well, maybe that's for maybe that's for the next call. That's that's for another day. But you're too kind, Seth. <laughs> you know, I, I want to wrap this up. Um, you 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 challenge uh, a lot of institutions in your book, and and for that you're to be commended. Um, and and the environmental community it doesn't get a um, doesn't get a pass. So you point out that an awful lot more focus has been put on um, issues of land conservation or surface water protection versus drinking water. So, um, and, and I'm not going to say that you're wrong. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I want to follow up and ask you what could, what could uh, organizations like ours that are, you know, more classically watershed associations that uh, worry about things like land use and setbacks from streams and protection of wetlands and forests and so forth. Um, you know, you know what? I, I, it's something I've thought a lot about, Jim. And I'm glad. I don't know if that you mean that to be the last question, but it's a it's a yeah. it's a wonderful question to close with. And, and this goes to education, education not just of our elected officials, but of our donor class. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a whole section in the book about the national, a couple of local ones, and they all struggle for funding, and that includes some of these organizations, <clears throat> which in the main have budgets of more than $100 million a year. Their drinking water component struggles to have $2 million a year of that. Um, <clears throat> and that's because, as I quoted somebody um, you know, who, I, who was in the book, who said she has to basically falsify every one of her grant applications and every time she goes to see a major donor or a foundation, because 
issues, drinking water issues just bore people. They don't want to do it. And I, and I, and I am of the belief, uh, and I've raised a lot of money for causes that I believe in, uh, I mean, millions and tens of millions of dollars I've raised over the, over the course of my lifetime. Um, I, I, I believe that it's a question of education, that not only do you need to educate the elected officials, which I think is relatively easier to do than to educate donors, because donors come to the party with a, this is what I want to achieve mentality. And I think it's worthy of the trouble to go after some larger public health donors and donors who do care about the environment to educate them as to why drinking water is worthy of significant support. There has never been a 10 or $20 million gift. I mean, think about all the $100 million gifts you read in the philanthropic you know, news reports, uh, philanthropy, uh, uh, the Chronicle of Philanthropy is the name of the publication that covers this. But you, you, you never see a 10 or 20 or $25 million gift for a drinking water charity, but you will see gigantic gifts, a hundred million dollar gift. There's, there's one gift given by actually somebody who's a dear friend of mine, gave a $750 million gift, $750 million gift to Caltech for uh, climate change issues. But, you know, and I'm not saying he should give, or, or he and his wife should give more money to drinking water, but because he's, he's extraordinarily generous and mind-blowingly generous. But just think about that, that you don't have a single mega donor who's thinking, oh boy, my big issue is drinking water. And wouldn't it be great if we could find a handful of mega donors and educate them as to why this could be a new generation's cause and that they could be the ones that own it. And I think they could get the glory of that if they want glory and they could get the satisfaction, uh, which I think is the main reason most people get into this kind of work. They get the great satisfaction of really changing people's lives in a significant way. You know, um, when I talk about, I mentioned earlier that in, in New Jersey, uh, you know, drinking water was perfected by by uh, a, a, a guy named John Leaf, who, who started adding chlorine to the water. It's very controversial. He was put on trial for it. Um, and But he changed the world. And I, I think that a donor for a relatively small amount of money can do so. I'd like to just, if I can, say one more thing. If, if it looks like you want to close, but let's say one more thing. In your opening remarks, you, I, I thought apologetically questioned, and I wrote it down, the timing of tonight's program you know, post-COVID and Ukraine and all this. And I think that we suffer from the idea that there's never quite the right time to talk about drinking water. Um, if we're going to wait until children are dying from cholera before we start talking about the drinking water, or if we're going to start waiting until we find birth defects galore from pharmaceutical residues in our drinking water, then we waited about 20 years too late. And I want to make the argument that informed, caring people have the capacity to, what's that expression, to walk and chew gum at the same time, and that not all of us are volunteering to go off and fight in, in uh, Ukraine's army, and that we have the ability to focus on more than one issue, but there are many people focusing on the hot issues of the day, and that we can choose to focus on less sexy, less hot issues. And I don't mean to demean anything about, you know, those more, those, are, those are very important issues. But one of the reasons they get so much attention and so much funding is because they've been deemed to be sort of the, of the moment, most important thing to talk about. And maybe they are, but it doesn't mean there aren't lots of other things that are also very important. You know, it's important that we feed our kids, but we also clothe them. We also plan vacations for them. We also buy them shoes. We are able to do more than one thing at a time. And I think that's true societally as well. Well, Seth, thank you um, so much. Thank you for your work um, and your writing and taking the time to speak out and for joining us here tonight. I, I think uh, we strongly agree that clean water, clean drinking water should be a fundamental human right. Yes. And we have a long way to go to get there, but um, your book certainly adds considerably to to that effort. So thank you um, again. I hope we talk again real soon. We will I hope so too. send out your, your contacts um, a, as you've uh, very generously allowed us to do. Um, and I just want to um, um, let folks know we have a, a, uh, some terrific other programs coming up. I'm just going to name four of those. So uh, March 22nd is something called World Water Day. It's an international global focus on 
on water. And we're celebrating that with some uh, public programming on Saturday, March 19th. So that's this Saturday. You can come and learn from our scientists and educators about water. Um, so look at our website, uh, thewatershed.org. You'll learn how to register for that. Um, upcoming next month, it's our series of stream cleanups. We'll be in uh, 12 to 15 different municipalities around central Jersey. I hope you'll come out and volunteer for that activity. Um, our next Wednesday webinar, Watershed Wednesday webinar, will be on backyard composting, and that's scheduled for April 20th. And then uh, the last one I want to mention is the annual meeting of the Watershed Institute, which will be on Monday evening, April 25th. Um, and we're very pleased that uh, our DEP commissioner, Sean LaTourette, will be joining us for our annual meeting to, to make some remarks. So thanks again for joining us. Um, we're, we're so pleased you could do so. And we're so grateful again to Seth Siegel for um, sharing his work and his passion with us this evening.